Hey, folks, we're live on the internet. <laughs> the, the wonderful te technology of capitalism. Uh, <laughs> and as you can see, I have a special guest with me. So this is a special show for me. Uh, Laura Schleifer is with me. And uh, Laura, you presented a, a talk about total liberation at the Boston um, Anarchist Book Fair. And I wanted to have it preserved forever on the internet. And so I've invited you to repeat it uh, on this uh, platform. So thanks very much for for doing that. And um, we shall just uh, let people give people a couple of minutes um, to join. Um, what we will be doing is uh, Laura will be presenting uh, a PowerPoint. And so it will be almost like a conference presentation. But we will have a Q&A um at the end so if people um have questions uh just put them in into the into the comments and we'll come back to them at the end so we we won't we won't miss them so michael and bernie v hello how are you doing so thanks a lot for coming on this uh yeah. i don't know what i don't know what the weather's like for you laura but it's it's been a, a really weird day in um dublin it's been kind of bright sunshine but very windy and then every now and again the, it just buckets down with the rain and it, it's kind of like you don't get any warning you know like normally you get a few spots in the thing and it just boom and I don't, I don't know whether this is a new thing in ireland or what but i've i've not um i've not experienced it before it just kind of goes from dry to raining <laughs> you know really quick <laughs> yeah i mean the weather has been really strange everywhere and it's of course quite scary because it's climate change um very dry here in the u.s i just heard that there is an official drought in um the majority now of the uh constitute the um 48 states um so it's uh you know, it's really severe. And actually in my town, there was an incident where um, there was a fire that started and because everything was so dry, the fire spread really quickly um, in a way that was very abnormal. So uh, it was um, quite scary. Yes. You, you know, the thing is, Laura, that um, with the climate crisis, or I think a lot of people are calling it cri climate chaos now, aren't they? Um, it's going to be the usual thing until the rich people in the developed world are affected badly they're going to ignore it if, if, it, if it's if it's only the people in the developing countries and etc and you know the kind of um, global south if they're the only ones being affected mainly it's going to be not really focused on until until we get affected even worse, you know, this, that's the way it's going to go, isn't it? And then the question is, is it going to be too late by then? I mean, this is such a perfect topic to open up my talk on total liberation, because this is literally what it's all about. You know, um, this idea of, oh, it's only that group over there that's having the problem, and that's not my problem, and that doesn't have anything to do with me. Um, that's at the root of everything that is wrong with the entire world. And I really do feel like climate change is kind of like the big, you know, smack in the face to make all of us, especially the more privileged um, on the spectrum, realize that. COVID is another example of that. You know, it's kind of like um, we keep getting these big messages uh, to wake us up to that, but a lot of people do not want to um, actually look at that reality. No, and of course, in in um, this part of Europe, the the war in Ukraine has taken a lot of the attention. Um, it, it's interesting how some wars get more attention than others, and I'm sure you'd have a an opinion about that. But of course, um, <laughs> we just think about the environmental devastation of what's going on in that respect. But in term in terms of the coverage of the climate crisis, it's it's no it's nowhere, you know, in that in that sense. So again, hmm. anyway, we'll do a few more intros and, and then we'll uh, we'll get going. I think so. Uh, we've said hello to Michael and Bernie V, uh, Linda, um, Jeremy the Ape, uh, hello, young man, 
Uh, Suzanne, uh, 3C Vegan Hunt Sabs. Hey, brilliant. Hi, how are you doing? It's always nice to have some hunt saboteurs um, along. And uh, that's how I started my uh, my thingy a long time ago now. So without further ado, then, I just repeat that um, Laura's going to do a, a PowerPoint. And this is a repeat of um, a great talk that was done at the Boston um, Anarchist Book Fair. Uh, so it's going to be like a presentation style. And then, but there will be a Q&A. So if you do think of any, um... oh, Lynn. Hi, Lynn. How are you doing? <laughs> That's brilliant. Um, uh, if you do think of any questions, put put them in, in the chat and we will go back to them. So we won't, we won't miss any, um, you know, so we will scroll all, all the way back. Uh, to start again. Uh, so if you think of them as Laura is talking, just put them in right right there and then. You don't have to kind of, you know, hold your piece and all that kind of stuff. Right. Let, let's bring us back to this. Yay. So this is uh, your title, Laura. So, yeah, uh, I want to thank you for doing this and uh, take it away. Thank you, Roger, and thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to do this, um, because I'm really thrilled that this is actually going to be um, available to more people now, and I really am looking forward to hearing people's thoughts on this, and I really hope that it starts a lot of conversations on this very, very broad topic. Um, and just to let anyone know who is unfamiliar with me, um, I am the Total Liberation Campaign Director at the Institute for Critical Animal Studies, which was founded by Anthony Nocella and Steve Best, who are two founders also of the Total Liberation Movement in general. Um, and I am also the co-founder of Plant the Land, uh, which is a vegan food justice team in Gaza. Um, so yes, I'm gonna be talking about Total Liberation as a concept, a theory, a uh, praxis. Um, it is a holistic approach to human, earth, and animal liberation. And if you're noticing the order of those words, um, that is because in that order they spell the word heal. And of course, I do believe that total liberation uh, is something that can be a force for healing, um, really, overall, the world's ills. Uh, so, um, I think we can, uh, move on. So what is total liberation? Um, total liberation grew out of the 1990s U.S. eco-anarchist and veganarchist movement as a way of combining intersectional anarchism with animal and earth liberation. Its goal was to reveal the intertwining of all forms of oppression and to build a mass movement between human, earth, and animal liberation movements based on shared interests and a shared understanding of how the same systems of violence, domination, and exploitation harm all of the above. So total liberation came out of the eco-anarchist, veganarchist movement. That is where its origins lie. It has always been. Um, an ideology of human and non-human animal and earth liberation combined. Um, it's different than historical anarchism um, because that always focused primarily on opposing the state and capitalism. Those were the two big designated enemies of um, the anarchist movements in centuries past. And Total liberation also includes explicitly addressing human identity-based forms of oppression, speciesism, and ecology, um, combining that with a class-conscious and anti-authoritarian analysis. So it kept anarchism's original focus on um, opposing all forms of hierarchy, um, you know, in government and in um, class, but it also brought in all identity-based forms of oppression and, of course, um, animal liberation and earth liberation. And total liberation strives to situate the many liberation movements within a single overall struggle, while also still remaining distinct parts of that bigger whole. 
Uh, so it was influenced by multiple schools of political thought, um, including intersectionality, anti-speciesism and veganism, eco-feminism, critical race theory. That one's gotten a, a lot of publicity, not in the right way in the U.S. lately. Um, Black power, pan-Africanism, Afrofuturism, queer theory, um, decolonization and land back movements, um, indigenous Eastern and global South belief systems, deep ecology and social ecology. So all combined, kind of bringing the best out of all of these to uh, form this overall way of approaching these issues. Okay, so we can continue. So total liberation um, has four stated pillars. Um, according to uh, one of its co-founders, environmental studies professor Dave Pello, um, and those four pillars are an ethic of justice and anti-oppression inclusive of humans, other animals, and ecosystems. Um, of course, it is an anarchist movement, uh, which is very significant. Um, it is anti-capitalism, of course, and it is embraces direct action tactics. So instead of waiting around for those in power to take action, it really advocates that we need to take collective action ourselves. Okay. Um, so here are a few of the foundational total liberation works. Um, Dave Pello's book, as we saw in the previous panel, Total Liberation, The Power and Promise of Animal Rights and the Radical Earth Movement. Steve Best, The Politics of Total Liberation, Revolution for the 21st Century. Yuri Gordon, Anarchism and Political Theory. Um, Brian Dominic, Animal Liberation and Social Revolution, A Vegan Perspective on Anarchism or an Anarchist Perspective on Veganism. Um, this one is written by an anonymous writer, Down with the Empire, Up with the Spring, Do or Die. Oh, sorry, Do or Die is the publication. And uh, Dave Pello and Holly Brems, From the New Ecological Paradigm to Total Liberation, The Emergence of a Social Movement Frame. Okay, so here are some metaphors um, that... Uh, different people have come up with to kind of help um, people understand this concept. Um, this one is the oppression tree. Uh, you may have seen this around, it's quite common. Um, and of course, it's this idea that all forms of oppression, you know, they look like they're all separate and dif different, but they're kind of all manifestations of um, the same thing and stemming from the same roots. Um, so, you know, and there's many different ideas about what the same thing is and what those roots are, uh, from an anarchist perspective, it would very clearly be that those, the root is hierarchy. That is the root of all forms of oppression. They're all different forms of hierarchy and they all, of course, inform and relate to each other. And of course, if you want to solve all of these different forms of oppression, you're going to have to get to the root um, and pull that out rather than trying to treat them as if they are distinct uh, individual problems. Um, and it's kind of ironic because, of course, we don't want to go around pulling up trees. <laughs> that, would, uh, that would be a not very total liberationist thing to do, not very ecological. But as a metaphor, it can help uh, to explain this concept. Okay. Uh, here's another one, the brick in the wall model. Um, so as you can see, these are all, again, they look like they're different forms. And in some ways they are, I mean, they are different forms of oppression. But um, as you can see, they're so entrenched in each other that to pull out one, you'd have to pull away all the others and you'd bring the whole wall down, right? So um, again, very kind of entrenched in each other. You can't separate them. You can't treat them as if they're separate. Um, okay, we can continue. Um, I personally like this one. Um, I feel that this is a very uh, expressive way of understanding this, which is the PRISM model. And what this is, is that you're looking at um, a PRISM, 
So, uh, you know, if you look through one angle, which is one form of hierarchy, you're going to see that. But if you look deeply enough, you're going to see all the other forms of hierarchy. And you can enter this overall system of hierarchy from all these different angles. So if you enter it through, let's say, trying to understand patriarchy, if you look deeply enough, you're going to start to see white supremacy and how patriarchy informs white supremacy. You're going to look deeply enough, you're going to see speciesism, right? And you're going to see um, the domination of other animals and the earth. And you're going to see, you know, all these different things. And it's going to help you to understand the original form that you're looking at, but also all the others more deeply, how the one informs the others and how they are all dependent upon each other to form that overall structure of hierarchy and domination. Um, there is one other one that I want to mention, um, which is Afko um, in her book, Racism as Zoological Witchcraft. Um, she depicts this, she's a Black vegan feminist, for those who don't know, and um, she depicts this as a house with many entrances, and, um, you know, whatever entrance you go in, you're going to reach the house, right? So if you enter the back door, let's say, um, if you enter, uh, let's say racism, you want to, um, understand more deeply, um, you're still going to reach, uh, speciesism eventually, or you'll still reach ableism eventually, or you'll still reach patriarchy eventually, whatever, uh, you enter, you will end up reaching all of them. So, I mean, these are all different ways of kind of uh, explaining the same thing. And the term that she uses for that is multidimensional liberation theory, um, which I would say is, is very closely related to total liberation. Um, so total liberation um, understands how oppression works like a chain reaction. So when an oppressive action, idea, or structure is created, um, inflicted, or enforced, it doesn't just affect the individual group or environment uh, that is directly targeted. What happens is that it sets off a chain reaction in which that action then goes on to indirectly affect other individuals, groups, regions. So starting with the most vulnerable and ultimately negatively impacting even the most remote and even the most privileged. So for example, what Roger was talking earlier with the climate change, right? is classic example of this. Um, these things are done that um, impact the most oppressed, the most disadvantaged, uh, the most directly, but it reverberates and eventually it comes back on all of us. So what we're doing to uh, non-human animals, to the earth, to the most oppressed human populations comes back on everyone in the end negatively impacts all of us. Okay, we can continue. Um, so one other model of understanding this, the ecosystem model. Um, in an ecosystem, everything is interdependent, which means that every individual living being needs to thrive in order for the entire ecosystem to thrive. So if you one individual or area that's not doing well, Eventually, it's going to affect everything else, and ultimately, the whole system will collapse. So all of life is interdependent. If you have one that's not doing well, everyone's affected. Um, so one theorist who had a lot of thoughts that are applicable to this, uh, Murray Bookchin, um, he had a theory of social ecology, um, and dialectical naturalism, and, um, that relates very much to total liberation. Uh, his conceptual framework of social ecology can help us develop an understanding of the interrelationship between human, animal, and ecological well-being. Um, and I should mention Bookchin was an anarchist theorist. Um, according to Bookchin, human society is an ecosystem in and of itself, 
which means that any single form of inequality, hierarchy, injustice, or oppression within human society causes the entire ecosystem of human society to suffer. So just as Martin Luther King Jr. said, an injustice to one poses a threat to everyone. If one human or one group of humans suffers, it affects all humans. However, human society itself is also just one part, one species, among the much greater ecosystem of all the animal species and of nature itself. So the same logic holds true there. If there is domination, hierarchy, and oppression within human society, it doesn't just impact human society negatively, it also impacts the entire rest of the animal kingdom and nature itself. So the dysfunction, inequality, hierarchy, oppression, all of that that's going on, fighting war, you know, um, systemic oppression, all of that's going on within human society, it obviously affects all the humans, but then as a species within the rest of nature, it also reverberates on the rest of nature and it causes uh, ecological catastrophe. However, what Bookchin left out is that this is also true in reverse. The human domination of nature and specifically of non-human animals doesn't just impact them, it impacts humans as well. So here are a few books that take a look at um, how that works in reverse, right? We have um, Animals and War, uh, Confronting the Military Animal uh, Industrial Complex. Um, we have An Unnatural Order uh, by Jim Mason, um, Uncovering the Roots of Our Domination of Nature and Each Other. And we have Animal Oppression and Human Violence, Domesticration, Capitalism, and Global Conflict by David Niebert. Those are just a few examples of some books that kind of show um, how that works in reverse. So Total Liberation recognizes that the human oppression of other animals fuels human oppression and ecological destruction, and likewise, that inequality and oppression within human society fuels ecological destruction and the oppression of other animals, both on an individual and species level. Taking a dialectical approach, it rejects both single-issue animal rights activism and left-wing humanism that leaves out non-human animals. So both of these are incomplete on their own. The idea behind total liberation is that if you really want to solve the issues of human oppression, you have to take the human domination and oppression of other animals into consideration and resist their oppression. And likewise, that if you want to solve the problem of the human domination and oppression of other animals, you have to look at human domination and oppression within human society. And all of this obviously is the same for ending the ecological crisis. So understanding total liberation as a conceptual framework um, for understanding the historical development and continued reinforcement of oppression. So here we have. Um, some pictures from ancient history um, really showing how far back this goes. I mean, it really goes all the way back to recorded history. Um, and uh, you can see over and over again in these images that these forms of violence that were inflicted on the one um, were inflicted on the other. And uh, forms of subjugation that were inflicted on one was inflicted, were inflicted on the other. So beating elephants into submission, beating enslaved humans into submission. Um, this goes all the way back to um, the beginning of uh, hierarchy within human society. We can continue. So this is the legacy of hierarchy, domination, subjugation, and brutality, what all systems of oppression are built on. Um, and again, this goes back really to the beginning of the formation of hierarchy within human society. Um, and um, 
you can see uh, in the images over and over again, the same forms of violence and brutality um, and subjugation against non-human animals and then used against humans that are um, in subjugated positions as well. So the same tools used to subjugate, dominate, and um, extract labor, um, exploit the other, whether they're human or non-human. So total liberation reveals how the subjugation, vilification, depersonification, infantilization, objectification, and commodification of non-human animals provides an ideological and material framework that the oppressor class can then weaponize against the human groups that it oppresses and violates through animalizing them. So basically this idea of creating these forms and ideas of violence against animals, non-human animals, this idea of it's okay to do these things to non-human animals because they are lesser than humans. And then um, using that idea and that foundation and saying, oh, well, it's okay to do that to these certain groups of humans because they are less like humans and quote unquote, more like these animals. We see this all over the place um, today. We see this all through, going back through time. Um, but I mean, this is still rampant today. Um, these are a few horrifying examples. Um, Black men saying it's like we're seen as animals, right? Um, so therefore they don't deserve the same rights as non-Black or specifically, especially white people, right? Because they're not quite human. They're quote unquote more like animals. This is the underlying logic. Um, Trump using that same trope to deny rights to immigrants. Um, these aren't people, they're animals. Um, we see, of course, these horrific images of children in cages, right? We can't let them free because they have to be controlled. They have to be dominated. They're more like animals. Um, and here we have Haitian refugees, um, and again, being treated like animals and also, um, using animals, non-human animals, to dominate and oppress humans, right? The horse is being used to dominate and control the human refugees. And again, the whole idea behind total liberation is to say, well, we need to question this original idea. Why do we think it's okay to treat non-human animals this way? Because that acceptance of treating them that way then provides the foundation that all it would take to take to treat a human that way is to make everyone else around them believe that they're quote unquote more like a non-human animal and therefore it's okay to treat them that way but if it's not okay to treat non-human animals that way then it's not okay to ever treat a human that way either so now we have objectification, right? Um, feminist uh, theorist, feminist vegan theorist, um, Carol Adams um, has really done groundbreaking work on the sexual exploitation of women and how uh, the they are, it's, again, it makes it seem like it's more acceptable to commodify them by comparing them to non-human animals. And again, we have to question that foundation, right? Why would we think that it's okay to commodify the bodies of other species? It's not okay to do that. But as long as we think it is, then that's all it takes is to um, basically say, oh, well, you know, women are more like animals and therefore they can be commodified too. And of course, it goes the other way around as well. Um, you know, animals are then sexualized. So it's okay to do that because women are objectified. Women are commodities. So 
Um, again, there's many, many different ways that this is expressed, but basically it's a way of deepening our understanding and resistance to the domination, exploitation, oppression, commodification, et cetera, of all these groups. So not using one in the service of the other, which is what a lot of animal rights activists sometimes will make the mistake of doing where they say, oh, you know, look at this other terrible thing that happened. And, you know, it's just like what happens to animals. And so we should, you know, only really care about the animals. Um, but it's to say that we can use all our understanding of these things. If we understand one um, in connection to the other, it will strengthen our understanding of both and our ability to resist all of these forms of oppression. Uh, so some recent works that ex examine how animalization and animal exploitation is used to subjugate colonized people. Um, Afro Dog um, by Benedict Boisseron, and this book looks at many different um, aspects of this, including the use of non-human animals um, by humans in the oppressor class to terrorize and control oppressed humans. So you can see, of course, um, there's the dog who's being used by the white man uh, to terrorize black protesters. So here is um, the exploitation of non-human animals and the oppression of non-human animals to then exploit and oppress and dominate subjugated humans. Um, Joshua Bennett's Being Property Once Myself, Blackness and the End of Man. So um, a Black scholar um, actually talking about, I was, my ancestors were, I would have been considered literal human property, right? And again, this question of why would we think that it would be acceptable to ever treat another individual as if they are property. Um, again, that foundation of it's okay to do it to non-human animals, right? This idea of that. And as long as we don't question that, that provides a foundation of, well, if it's okay to do to them, then it's okay to do to certain humans that are quote unquote, more like animals, supposedly not fully human. So dehumanization, um, animalization then makes that seem allowable because we accept the idea that it's acceptable to do to other species. And uh, the aforementioned racism as zoological witchcraft, a guide to getting out, um, AFCO, uh, definitely an amazing book, um, really looks at this from a very broad perspective. And um, yeah, I'm just gonna recommend it. <laughs> Um, so the slaughterhouse industry is one example of many how the subjugation of humans fuels the oppression of non-human animals and vice versa. If you look closely into slaughterhouses, you will find so many different issues of human oppression, um, environmental racism and classism, um, obviously um, horrendous animal exploitation and abuse. Um, but you're going to get all of these issues because, of course, um, nobody wants to be tasked with the horrible job of killing other sentient individuals all day, every day. And so, of course, um, nobody wants to be around that. Nobody wants to live near that. Nobody wants to have to do that job. So who is forced to do those things? The poorest humans, the most disenfranchised, they're the ones who have to do those jobs. They're the ones who have to live in the areas where that is going on. Um, and the privileged have the luxury of distancing themselves. So slaughterhouse workforces are made up of workers who have no legal rights for the most part. Um, overwhelmingly undocumented immigrants, um, recent immigrants, um, currently imprisoned people, um, 
or ex-convicts, um, people who can't get other jobs, people who are the poorest, the most indigent, um, you know, all kinds of uh, pollutants coming out of there, toxins coming out of there. Obviously, it's only very poor people, usually communities of color that live around these things. So you've got all these different issues entwined with this horror of these sensitive, sentient beings being tortured and killed all day, every day, which of course has horrifying psychological effects on the workers as well, which then impacts the community in other ways. Studies have been done on how um, there that ends up uh, leading to other forms of violence because people can't con control their trauma. Um, and so that has other psychological effects such as domestic violence, et cetera. So, I mean, it's just so many different issues stemming from this one system of violence. And again, to really understand, we have to look at all of them together holistically. Um, so total liberation, um, and before I even get to this, I just wanna mention one other thing about the slaughterhouse as an example is that um, as long as we have slaughterhouses, we're going to need a certain class of people to not have the full rights, right? Because there needs to be a subjugated class of humans who have to do this horrible work. So it actually requires a class system. It actually requires to keep people uh, disenfranchised in some way, um, whether that's through the prison system or whether that's through denying a pathway to citizenship or whatever it is. Um, racism, obviously, it is needed to have an underclass to do this horrible work and to live in those areas and have to put up with the effects of that. So um, total liberation recognizes how an injustice to one is a threat to justice to all. Again, that's Martin Luther King speaking. And um, again, this idea that you can't separate these things, what affects one ultimately will affect all. Um, it's rooted in anarchism, opposed to all forms of hierarchy. It doesn't center the concerns of any one particular oppressed group, but it takes a general approach of always working from the ground up rather than from the top down. So instead of centering any one group, it builds solidarity between different individuals and groups by recognizing how each issue relates to and informs the others. So in other words, um, there are individuals and groups within this bigger movement that we're trying to build that focus on specific issues, um, but a total liberation movement itself is kind of the glue that, the vegan glue obviously, that uh, brings all of these movements together where they realize um, their common interests and common ground and common oppressors. Um, it is decentralized and consensus-based or directly democratic, so no leaders, um, which is, of course, very important uh, in the anarchist tradition. It is opposed to the ownership, quote-unquote, of humans, other animals, and the concept of owning land or owning nature. All of this is anathema because how can you possibly own nature? It's not anyone's property. It's It exists for its own sake, and it's to be shared collectively by all the species on the planet, not owned by any one individual or group. Um, it is a movement based on the accomplice model of working in solidarity for collective liberation from the current system, rather than based on privileged allies helping more marginalized individuals rise up in the current status quo. So it rejects participation in the current status quo. Um, it really is looking to build its own new um, institutions and systems, uh, non-hierarchical. And it's um, accomplice-based because, of course, it's rooted in this understanding of um, your problems are not separate from me. It's not like, oh, you know, I'm the privileged person and I'm just going to help you or, um, you know, or vice versa. It's 
your problems are my problems because ultimately um, everything that happens to you will affect me in the end. And therefore we need to stand in solidarity with each other and approach this as again, against these, these systems of oppression. Um, it recognizes that the existence of privilege is an indication that there is an oppressive force ruling from above that decides who gets privilege and who doesn't and who can change and revoke that at any time. So it makes a clear distinction between privilege versus power. Um, it certainly would say that people with privilege should be using that privilege to take away power from the dominant systems and distribute it to where it is something that um, empowers grassroots uh, and oppressed communities. But it recognizes that there is a difference between privilege versus power, that just because you have privilege um, doesn't mean that you actually, that's the same as having power. Um, it understands that true liberation requires both positive and negative forms of freedom. So these are two concepts from philosophy of um, different types of freedom. Uh, positive freedom is the freedom to do or access things. For example, the freedom to access housing if you need it. Um, negative freedom is the freedom from controlling or oppressive forces. So um, freedom from forced military service, we'll say. Uh, so it says, well, yes, you should have the freedom to not participate in a military, but you also should have freedom to access housing so that, for example, you don't need to join the military anyway, even though you're not being forced to because you need uh, money to access housing or education or these other things that you wouldn't have the freedom to access otherwise. Um, it analyzes social pro problems through both an ideological and materialist lens. Um, so not one or the other, but again, taking an expansive approach that looks at all elements and aspects. Um, it studies history to understand events through a multidirectional lens and to learn, oh, the, uh, the uh, image got cut off, but um, basically to learn how to build a better future. Um, so there is a new theory that's just come out called multidirectional memory theory. There's um, a book by that title. And basically the idea behind it is looking at historical events in connection with each other of, again, how they relate to and inform one another. Um, so uh, a kind of more multidimensional way of looking at history and um, leading that to understanding the present and how to move forward from here. Okay, we can move on. Um, it takes the perspective of a strength in solidarity mindset that believes that we're stronger working together for our collective liberation rather than a scarcity or competition-based mindset in which one group's interests are pitted against another's. So um, again, this idea of, you know, my liberation is bound up with yours. Let's work together. We have a common oppressor um, rather than competing interests. Um, and, you know, if, if, you, if you're liberated, then that's going to threaten my liberation, you know, because there's only room for one. Uh, so total liberation says, no, actually, um, all forms of liberation are interdependent on each other. Um, it looks at how each oppressive system affects and is affected by every other oppressive system. It examines how constructs and binaries, so for example, um, race, gender, borders, laws, citizenship, money, even the construct of the human as supposedly being separate from the rest of the animal species, are created and exist to serve, maintain, and reinforce dominant power structures. So all of these constructs um, and these sort of false divides, um, oh, you know, my land ends here and your land begins there, um, 
or, you know, all of these things are just basically ways of kind of maintaining the um, overall systems of hierarchy and domination. Um, it views how each oppressive system within human society affects other animals and nature, and likewise, how the oppression and destruction of other animals and nature impacts oppressed humans. So again, looking at all three of these things in connection with each other. Um, it sees and addresses both parallels and commonalities and intersections of oppression. Um, it stands in solidarity with all identity-based forms of oppression, but also looks at the entire system of hierarchy and domination through the lens of each identity-based system of oppression. And finally, it focuses on building liberatory alternatives to the current system and making them inclusive rather than looking for ways to include people in a hierarchical oppressive system. So it builds a dual power challenge to the existing system in order to make it possible for people to leave the current system and join the new one. So in other words, um, yes, it is radically inclusive, but it's inclusive in these new systems that it's creating um, basically as a competition for the current system to say, well, you know, if you don't like the current system, you don't have to participate in that because we have this new one that we're building. Um, so for example, a, a mutual aid network, right? If you don't want to be buying from the capitalist system, um, you can come to us and we share everything. And um, in doing so, you know, rather than trying to make the capitalist system more inclusive, we're saying, we're going to include everyone in this better way of doing things that is intrinsically fairer and based on solidarity and kindness and all the rest of it. Okay, so we can continue. So, um, Total liberation views things through a wide angle lens that sees the bigger picture, but also the particular issues within that situation. So in any given situation, um, it always considers the impact in all three key aspects, the humans, the other species and the earth. Um, I thought this poster from the Palestinian Animal League conference was um, really helpful in illustrating this concept because as you can see, it says defending Palestine um, liberating the people, the land, and animals, right? So it's looking at this big issue, which is colonialism, right? It's the Zionist colonization of this land. And it's saying, how does this oppressive system of colonialism affect everyone and everything on this land? Human, non-human animal, and the land itself, the ecology. Um, and that's really such a great way of kind of explaining the sort of like wide angle lens that, you know, like Afka was saying in her example, um, you know, the house is colonialism, but, uh, you know, you can enter in, um, you know, all these different ways, right? If you want to know how does uh, colonization affect the land, you're inevitably, you need to look at how it's affecting the humans that live on that land, the indigenous people of that land and the other animals or vice versa, whatever entry point, you need to look at all three of those aspects. So total liberation is dialectical. It both aims to resolve the tension between the human and non-human animal liberation movements and to reveal how both are incomplete without the other. And this is the symbol from the Institute for Critical Animal Studies, which I love because, of course, you've got half a human fist and half a paw, and they're both raised. <laughs> but it shows that one is incomplete without the other. They complement each other to build a stronger movement together for total liberation. Is total liberation the same thing as intersectionality? <laughs> this is the big question of the day. <laughs> and I really have to thank um, the Black vegan, um, queer vegan scholar, uh, Christopher Sebastian McJetters. Some of you might know him. He's definitely one of my favorite people in this movement for really clarifying what is the difference 
between these ideas and why it's so important to understand that. Um, so the term intersectional was created by uh, the Black feminist legal scholar Kimberly Crenshaw to explain how individuals, um, originally Black women and other women femmes of color, but um, of course it's extended, you know, it's used much more um, expansively now to really just talk about anybody who has multiple uh, marginalized identities can be multiply oppressed based on the um, multiple marginalized aspects of their identities, which then overlap with, reinforce, and compound their overall oppression, right? So the original idea was um, both Black women and Black men suffer from racism, but a Black woman is going to experience that differently than a Black man um, because she's a woman and she also has to deal with sexism and um, racism and sexism together uh, form different forms of sexism that are racialized and different forms of racism that are uh, sexualized. So um, that's one example. Um, I definitely would agree with um, some people who have made the argument that that also affects Black men, that gender um, really affects the way that they experience racism as black men um, in a way that would be very different than just a sort of like gender neutral racism. Um, but uh, anyway, so that was the original idea. And while total liberation is inherently pro-intersectional and incorporates intersectionality into its analysis, intersectionality in and of itself is focused on human identity-based oppressions not the oppression of non-human animals or the broader natural world. So in his essay, Yes to Intersectionality, Boo to Intersectional Vegans, Black queer animal liberationist and radical vegan theorist Christopher Sebastian McJetters criticizes the application of intersectionality to animal liberation and veganism because it both decenters non-human animals from their own movement um, and it appropriates a liberatory tool created for Black women and femmes um, and other multiply marginalized people. So Kimberly Crenshaw never meant for this to be applied to non-human animals um, or the earth. And um, it's really about uh, what people go through when they have um, different identity-based oppressions uh, within themselves. So it's quite different. It is included in total liberation, but total liberation um, includes much more intersectionality as one piece of a bigger um, overall liberatory project, we'll say. So reasons why the left is often hostile towards the idea of including animals in their moral community and the pitfalls of humanism. Um, so of course we hear this all the time, stop treating us like animals. But then again, this issue of not questioning why it would be acceptable to treat animals, non-human animals that way um, from the left. And obviously um, a lot of animal rights activists um, who do care about human rights, um, you know, very baffled by this, right? I know I certainly was uh, when I first started realizing that that was an issue, um, because of course it would seem like, well, you know, these things are wrong to do to anyone, right? If you care about the rights of, um, you know, those who are oppressed and harmed, then, you know, why wouldn't you care about that for everyone? Um, and there's a really great essay by a um, vegan philosopher named Will Kimlicka um, in The Statesman that talks specifically about this issue. And basically what he says is that, well, there are many reasons, um, you know, why people in general might not want to adopt an animal rights uh, perspective. Obviously, you know, the fact that we um, as a society eat animals and exploit them in other ways is a big motivating factor. But there's a specific, specific point of contention with the left. Um, and that is the fact that human rights movements have basically 
built themselves very consciously on this idea of we have to prove that we, the oppressed groups of humans, are human and separate ourselves from non-human animals because, of course, there is this idea that, um, you know, only humans deserve rights and non-human animals do not. And so it's a very scary um, premise, very, very understandably so, to um, take away that dividing line. So they've actually, and he talks about how in the civil rights movement um, in the U.S. in the 1960s, that was very deliberate that they were actually going to strengthen that binary between humans and non-human animals and say, we are on, as Black people, we are on the human side of that binary um, and distance themselves. So that's certainly understandable um, why that would be very threatening to um, subjugated human groups, oppressed human groups, animalized human groups. Because of course, this idea that they're not quite human, that they're more like animals, is the entire foundation um, for why it would be considered acceptable to treat them in ways that are not the way that we would normally think <laughs> humans should be treated. Um, but what's interesting is that actually some research is being done on this now, um, where what they're seeing is that actually when you put down non-human animals, when you um, reinforce this idea that they're lesser than, it actually does reinforce human forms of oppression. And on the other hand, when you um, uplift non-human animals, when you see them as having more intrinsic value and more personhood and more subjectivity, actually what that does is it has an alleviating effect on human forms of bigotry, prejudice, and um, oppression. So uh, it's a very interesting thing. Um, I would definitely recommend reading um, that article. Uh, maybe we can put it in the links below. And um, you know, it's definitely something that I think that both human rights, human liberation movements, and animal liberation movements, um, non-human animal liberation movements should be uh, taking into consideration because there's a causal link uh, between those two things. So total liberation realizes that without addressing human attitudes towards other animals and nature, um, and what that tells us about human identity and human nature, the left leaves that powerful conceptual framework up to the fascist right wing. So what's really stunning about this is that while the left, the humanist left, um, really wants to stay away from this idea of looking at how the, um, the, the view of non-human animals and the oppression of non-human animals, how that relates to oppression within human society, um, the right wing, on the other hand, absolutely will, will adopt that idea and use it to their purposes. And I showed two horrifying examples of how this was done, um, which were social Darwinism um, and the eugenics movement, right? So social Darwinism, of course, was this idea of, oh, well, um, now we realize that humans are a species of animal. We are a species of primate. Um, we evolved from a common ancestor along with other primates. So now we're going to basically kind of um, look at how that would indicate that we should function in this um, way that is dog eat dog, that is law of the jungle, um, you know, species hierarchies, you know, um, imprinted onto within humanity, just all kinds of really, really warped things that came out of this idea of, well, um, if we are non-human animals, if there's a connection between us and non-human animals, um, this is the ideological framework that we're going to build out of that idea. The eugenics movement, uh, which came directly out of social Darwinism, right? Well, if it's okay to do these things to non-human animals, um, at like, for example, selective breeding for desired traits or um, getting rid of certain individuals that, you know, might pollute the gene stock 
of the um, dominant population. If we can do that to other animals, and after all, humans are just another species of animal, we can do it to humans too, right? So the oppressor using this to advance their agenda, their logic. If we don't take up this argument ourselves, we leave the field wide open for them to do it, which is very dangerous. Um, okay, we can continue. Um, but at the same time, total liberation also recognizes that without addressing human oppression and injustice, animal rights activists risk animal rights being used as a justification to disregard or even violate the rights of humans. So it can go the other way around as well. Um, and this is where you really get these things like vegan Nazis, for example. Uh, that's a picture of a vegan Nazi YouTube channel from Germany. Um, and a horrifying picture from Nazi Germany, not to pick on modern day Germans, um, <laughs> but these are just two examples. Um, that I found of this, um, but here's Nazi Germany um, where Hitler is being saluted by, actually that's not Hitler, I think that's, um, I'm not sure if that's Himmler or who, but being saluted by rabbits because the Nazis had just passed a policy um, for uh, banning vivisection on animals, non-human animals. Um, and I should say non-human because of course they were all about vivisection on certain humans. <laughs> so, um, you know, but they use this as um, an excuse. Uh, one of the things that they said was, well, we have to um, do these terrible things to Jews or to um, other groups because uh, on the basis that, um, oh, for example, the, you know, kosher practices are cruel to non-human animals. So to protect them, we have to then um, imprison or exterminate Jews. So it's a very, very dangerous uh, form of logic. I've seen quite a few manifestations of this type of logic in the vegan movement, very disturbing. You know, I've seen uh, examples of people saying things like, oh, there was a big natural disaster, all these people died, or there was a mass shooting, all these people died or whatever. Um, but then again, those people were probably not vegan. So, Maybe that's a good thing, right? The sort of misanthropic logic that's terrifying of, well, you know, the death of non-vegans is a win for the animals, so actually we should celebrate those sorts of things. So very, very scary what happens when you look at types of oppression in isolation. It can lead to very scary forms of logic all around. Okay, we can continue. Um, and of course, total liberation is an anarchist uh, theory, praxis, and anarchism can provide us with a powerful antidote to speciesist right-wing framings of non-human animals and what that supposedly tells us about human nature. Um, so this is a classic anarchist text by um, the Russian anarchist Peter Kropotkin. Um, mutual aid, a factor of evolution. And Kropotkin went around studying all different uh, species of non-human animals in response to social Darwinism, because um, of course the oppressor class of his time were justifying their actions on the basis of, oh, well, that's what animals are like in nature. They are very cutthroat, they are competitive, they dominate uh, through violence, et cetera. And um, he went into nature and then he saw animals cooperating and um, helping each other. And that's why it's called mutual aid. And he saw a completely different view of how other animals operate. And that made him realize, well, if they're like that, then maybe humans should be that way too. So it provided a complete foundation of um, understanding of human nature that is very different than the right wing framing that is rooted in the supposed um, nature of other animals. And last panel. So um, just a couple of quotes that I think are helpful for understanding total liberation. Um, one is by the Aboriginal scholar, Lilia Watson. Um, and she says, if you have come to help me, you're wasting your time. But if you've come because your liberation is tied up with mine, 
then let us work together. So I think this one is very important because it really, to me, um, explains the difference between the ally versus the accomplice model, right? Um, the ally or really savior, <laughs> um, you know, comes and says, oh, well, you know, um, I don't need anything. I'm just doing fine, but I'm going to help you. And there's that distance there. Um, and uh, on the other hand, the accomplice says, you know what, this is a really bad situation for both of us. Um, maybe it's worse for you, but it's bad overall. It's harming everyone and everything, and we need to work together to get rid of it. Um, and uh, the other quote is from Angela Davis. Probably not much introduction needed for that one, but um, of course she is a Black feminist radical scholar, former Black Panther, etc., and also a vegan. And she says, I think there is a connection between the way we treat animals, non-human animals, and the way we treat people who are at the bottom of the hierarchy. Um, so again, illustrating this idea of these are not separate things. The one informs the other, influences the other, impacts the other, etc. So that's it. <laughs> um, and uh, <laughs> it's a lot of information to take in at once, I know, but uh, very important information, I think. Right. Well, thank you so much, uh, Laura, for that and um, for presenting that uh, that slideshow. And um, I've been monitoring the, the chat as we went. There's quite a lot of statements mainly rather than questions, but there are some questions. I just thought I just thought I might as well go through uh, what, what we've got so we don't um, miss anything. Um, mm -hmm. So I think the first thing was from Jeremy the Ape. Referring to the human aspects of society is one of my new favorite expressions to highlight that humans are not all of society. Our fellow animals are part of society as well. So that's um, that's quite a, quite a really interesting idea. And obviously mm. that would kind of almost um, challenge some big uh, part of the construction. You know, we, 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 are, we are it and we are all kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Um, here's a... Uh, just something to make you go red here. You've got a wonderful Thank way you. of <laughs> getting uh, complex ideas over. And then we have this. Do you want to say something about that? <laughs> I just wanted to say I really appreciate that feedback because, honestly, this is a lot to take in. <laughs> and, um, you know, obviously I'm, I'm pulling from a lot of different theories here and, you know, even just things that I've kind of like mulled over over the years and so it's like really good to hear that it's actually comprehensible because it's um yeah it's it's a lot uh, jeremy again um this is the kind of having it both ways kind of idea uh, for now being like an animal is considered an insult uh i, I i've been shouted up by, by the cat here so, so when species defend animal use with yeah but uh Animals eat other animals, which is a a, a, a big uh, theme of the scripts that that species use on TikTok, particularly simultaneously using using them as an insult and a moral ben benchmark. So um, it's it's remarkable how they do that, really. But it's a very common thing to happen. Um, yeah, that's something that um, I've become increasingly um, aware of. The longer that I've been involved in this movement, is the ways that. Um, this distortion of how other animals behave um, and their supposed lack of uh, moral capacity um, is used then as a justification by humans who want to commit oppressive acts against others and say, well, you know, I can't help it. I'm just an animal myself. Um, but then, of course, when it serves them, yes, the other way as well, right? Um, oh, well, you know, they're just animals and I'm morally, you know, superior and I do have the capacity for morality. But uh, yes, it's a very much um, goes both ways with that. Uh, there's yeah. an astonishing. It's very, very selective, isn't it, as well? Legacy of that. So. Yeah, absolutely. Mm. So it's a little bit like the vivisection logic that, um, well, they they are unlike us, so we can research on them, 
and the reason that the the results are valid is because they're like us so right exactly yeah very similar to that and that was a comment from uh, lynn when you were talking about uh, property uh, status of uh, humans at the time um all right so i think it's, it might be the first question is it possible for a structure without leadership to defeat a structure with leadership uh that's really interesting i, I use mm -hmm. i used to um ask students in the university whether they could envisage even elements of society like for example a shopping center running without a leadership and and they couldn't really wow yeah there's a name for that it's called a co-op <laughs> right <laughs> yeah. uh so it's it's just it's all they're all leaders you know everybody runs it collectively um but yeah i mean we're so you know um acculturated into this way of thinking that nothing could ever exist without a hierarchical power structure that we can't even envision anything else um so yeah is it possible for structure without leadership to defeat a structure with leadership i think this is a really big question right now um certainly not just in our movement but even in the world right now um because you know, th things are kind of aligning in this way of, oh, well, you know, if you don't support one, then you have to support the other, you know, um, one authoritarian or the other, or one party or the other. Um, and it's because people don't have faith that uh, something that is more decentralized could win. Um, but I think the big key here is that we have to think of this um, not in an individualist way, but in a collectivist way of individuals, right? So a co-op, but a really big co-op. Um, and uh, then, you know, like smaller uh, co-ops, we'll say within that bigger movement, um, all working together, organizing together. Um, and the other thing I'm going to say about this is the big thing about dual power, um, because so dual power is this idea of building the new system while we're still living under the old system, but making that new system um, so great <laughs> and so able to sustain people's needs that they start withdrawing from the old system and gravitating to the new system because it's possible to do so, because the new so system can sustain them. So um, that's what I believe we should be really putting our energies into is building this new system in a way that attracts people away from the old system. Because at the end of the day, a leader only has the power of their followers <laughs> and of all the people that participate in the system that they lead. If everybody flees the coop, then they're just left alone and, um, you know, they're the leader of one. So I think that. It is possible, but, you know, it's obviously not easy. It's not a, a quick fix solution. Last thing I'm going to say about this is that the Zapatistas in Mexico, they're an indigenous resistant movement in Mexico, and um, they, you know, are all about having a leaderless movement, and they have had a lot of success, but they really prioritize this idea of it's not going to happen quickly. And so they've chosen as their symbol the snail. And um, the snail is their mascot because, of course, snails move very slowly. And I've never been to that region of Mexico, but from what I've heard in Chiapas, uh, they have things like snail shaped houses and buildings and mailboxes and everything to remind people this. It, we are in this for the long haul. It's not going to happen quickly, but it's going to happen the right way. And it's going to really lead to liberation in the end, not just another hierarchical oppressive system. Yeah, they used to talk about instead of email, they talked about snail mail, didn't they? But uh, right. this this is one of the um, which, this is one of the big issues, isn't it? About um, about the idea of moving towards an anarchic system, you, you've got the transition uh, problem. And um, in um, 1969, uh, Ralph Miliband wrote really an interesting essay, and in that he said that um, that the mass media can't bring about a completely concert conservative structure on its own but what what it's good at is ridiculing any alternative and, and almost like taking the piss kind of thing and so uh, i suppose the um, the modern day version of that would be donald trump and his thing about fake news so as as things change and you and you're trying to make a, a new system attractive 
you've got the old system ridiculing it, right? So that's one of the mm -hmm. major problems for it, I suppose. Mm, definitely. Oh, and I also wanted to quickly respond to the comment before that about women being classified as chattel up until 1947 in... Um, 67, yeah, I think so. Yeah, I got that. Wow. Um, yeah, in the UK. Wow. Um, and actually, I looked up the etymology of the word chattel recently, and it does literally come from cattle. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah, yeah, that says a lot right there. I know, obviously, that's the, um, the, the, the base word for capitalism, too, isn't it? Yes, the cap of their heads, right? Like mm. decapitate, counting the number of heads of cows. In, um, yeah, and that's where the idea of units of production came from as well. So right. the kind of, uh, re you know, re reductionist kind of thinking, that kind of thing. Right. And um, this measurement of wealth by how many animals you quote unquote own. Yeah. Yeah. I think I think this this comment go went back to when you were talking about um, the positive and negative things, which I, mm. um, I immediately translated that into positive and negative rights. But um, I don't know if you wanted to, to tackle that one. Aren't all forms of liberation a positive freedom under anarchy? Um, yeah. Uh, well, mm, I don't know, because if you're looking at the terms positive freedom and negative freedom, um, in their original terms, you know, it would say, uh, of course, positive freedom is the freedom to do, you know, to access the things uh, that you need um, and want. It's to um, participate in things, right? But negative freedom would be freedom from um, controlling oppressive, uh, coercive forces, etc. So, uh, for example, um, you know, in an anarchist society, um, I think you would still need freedom from, like, for example, um, freedom from somebody assaulting you right um you would then need freedom to access protection from that happening so there's the freedom from and then the freedom to but you know there would still need to be some sort of um protection that would exist to protect your freedom from uh certain things so um, I would I would personally say that uh, you know you would need both forms of freedom really to have um, an anarchist society that was truly free. Yeah, and again, with like you need both both types of rights as well. So yeah, uh, I, I would probably agree, agree with that. Not quite sure what race lever is referring to. Um, on human arms also play um, the your land hens in mind. So I don't know what what is that boundaries. Um, I'm not quite yeah, sure I would what, need where that fits like, with what you were saying, but hmm. yeah, I would need um, specific examples. Um, yeah. Well, race. If, yeah. if you if you if you want to clarify that uh, lower down, then uh, feel free. Um, I love this from Lynn. Um, just a little statement which I thought was really um, in interesting. Um, yeah. Again, you know the the idea of lo looking at uh, at things differently, but that idea is then kind of um, clarified here, um, yeah. in a sense. Leadership is uh, setting example, and often skills, knowledge, experience mean that at times the individual may lead because their skill. Well, I mean that all just feeds into the, to the best of your abilities idea, I suppose, doesn't it? Yeah, um, that's really a great way of putting it. It's so clear and it's so concise and it really does um, kind of like make it very clear what is the difference between uh, institutionalized hierarchy, right? A person in a role versus just someone who's naturally exhibiting um, leadership traits that could be very beneficial to a community because they don't have mm. power over the others. Yeah, I mean, it, it, you know, I mean, like people will use leadership to gain status and and um, and money and everything. If if you didn't think of it as as being for that, then le leadership wouldn't be such a um, su such a kind of bad word because it's kind of you know, I mean, from from our point of view, it's kind of tied in with you know capitalistic relations and the idea of you know status, money, that kind of stuff. Um, mm -hmm. So I think I think that's the thing there. Uh, Lynn also said this, which is 
This is interesting. I, I once knew a um, Australian anarchist. I, I worked on an organic farm uh, with them for a while. And they were opposed to specialism. They thought that everybody should, in an anarchist world, become, I think I think they described it as a jack of all, all trades, which is a bit gendered. But um, So the, the idea that you wouldn't have a specialist. But of course, then it's a question of whether you would gain, be able to gain the expe expertise. Because you know, obviously, the idea of, of an expert is they'd be able to concentrate on their expertise, wouldn't it? Right. Yeah, I mean, I personally would say that um, I, I see why there could be an argument made for that to a certain extent, um, because, you know, in the class society, um, the class-based society, the capitalist society, or any kind of hierarchical class society, um, you know, it's very much this sort of like uh, compartmentalized, standardized um you know, this person has this function, that person has that function, and that keeps us all debilitated and uh, alienated from each other. And it really stunts our growth to be fully rounded human beings and to also, again, understand, you know, how these uh, different uh, disciples inform each other and, you know, take more multidisciplinary or interdisciplinary approach. So, um, I see where they're going with that, but I think, you know, there's a balance between that and then we don't want it to be just kind of like we're all atomized and we have to fulfill, you know, all of our needs individually, um, but rather interdependent that, you know, I have a broad range of knowledge, but I also have my area that I really put my focus on and where my skills lie and then somebody else has theirs as well and we complement each other. So I think it has to be a bit of both. Mm. And I think it also points out in in the the power of language because we're talking about leadership, and of course sociologists talk about prime movers in say social movements, and that of course is you could say well that's playing with words, but it it does get over the fact that that it's an it's a a kind of better way of putting the same idea that you've got somebody who's taking a leadership thing, but you're not calling them leadership because it's kind of a loaded term, I suppose. Mm -hmm. Now, this is this is one that's going to be interesting. Bernie V. Would it be better to approach total liberation through a spiritual strategy? Um, I personally think that, you know, it's you can certainly include that. Um, but it's I think this is where I said earlier about total liberation being both ideological and material, right? So um you know, there's a lot of different liberatory ideologies that I think have a place and relevance to and can enhance our understanding and practice of total liberation. And, you know, that certainly could be one of them. But ultimately, it also has to change on the material level. And we need to build a foundation of how to do that in a tangible way. So, um, I don't think I don't think they cancel out each other. I think again that the one can inform the other and empower the other, but it does need to be um, practiced on multiple fronts. You Marxist, you okay? This is um... <laughs> <laughs> this, little this, bit this... <laughs> that influence and in anarchism and you know best of everything. <laughs> Hopefully, yeah, yeah. That's, that's like an insult nowadays. Um, the uh, <laughs> I, I like this one because this followed from what. Uh, Bernie V was saying, but um, this reminded me of uh, something that Leslie Cross said, which was the veganism is an affirmation uh, that where love exists, exploitation ends. Mm, and I thought that, yes. that was quite, yeah, that's 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 quite an interesting kind of idea. Uh, I suppose I suppose it's a it's a bit hippy trippy. I suppose if you if you want, I mean, it's not not got you know it's the the language issue again. I suppose, but there you go. Mm. Um. Yeah, I mean, I think that's true if it's real, but I think that, um, so, you know, I'm, I mentioned Bookchin earlier and he's been a big uh, influence. He's an anarchist uh, philosopher who's been a big influence on a lot of my thinking. And he has this concept of um, an ecology of freedom in the case of the book that he read, but I've been kind of applying it all over the place now because I just find it to be such, um, a uh, really helpful 
tool of analysis. So basically, um, his book is called The Ecology of Freedom. And for the longest time, actually, before I read the book, I was screwing up the title and calling it The Freedom of Ecology, because I thought it was about ecosystems and needing to be free, you know, that the ecosystem needs to be free of human interference, domination, exploitation, etc. Um, but then I realized that I was flipping the title and it was called The Ecology of Freedom for a very specific reason, because he was saying, well, um, you know, part of it was, of course, you know, ecology being free from the things as in the ecosystem, but also that freedom itself as a concept um, needs a lot of different elements in it to really work. And so it's like an ecology of freedom. What are the different elements that would be needed to create an ecosystem where freedom would flourish? I think the same is true of love. I would say that there is an ecology of love. So love is like this kind of like amorphous concept. Um, you know, there's a lot of different ways of understanding it. But I think especially in terms of building liberatory movements, it would be helpful to say, well, what are the elements that we would need to be able to build a movement that was rooted in love, right? Um, so for example, I would say trust would be a foundational element of that ecosystem, right? You can't have love if we don't trust each other. Um, mutual aid, mutual support, solidarity, valuing each other, um, intrinsically, you know, um, having each other's back, like all of these things, and there's a lot more too, but I would be like, if we really want to build a movement based on love, we have to really think very deeply about what that would entail. Yeah. Well, it reminds me of, um, Marcuse and Eros and civilization, uh, which for some people mm -hmm. it's, it's it's too kind of fundamentally kind of Freudian, but uh, it's an interesting uh, book. Uh, let's move on to Jeremy the Ape again, and um, I want to uh, bring this back because this this kind of like um, uh, Jeremy's question reminded me of something I wanted to ask you. Going back to your wall um, idea, and and about the idea that. Um, is total liberation too big? Certainly when it comes to, as it were, explaining it. And, you know, in in some senses, you know, Jeremy's done quite a lot of street work, as it were. And so it would be difficult to kind of imagine st stood there <laughs> on a street corner ex ex explaining it. You know, so in in that sense, that that's why a lot of animal advocates, I think, think that the not not even in terms of the wideness of, of 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 the slide, even the idea of animal rights need to need to be thought of as a wall, and you yeah. take the bricks down, you might like, take out the circuses, take out the hunting, right. you know, yeah, yeah, um, yeah, absolutely, it's a very big idea. That is absolutely true. Um, you know, I would say that if you had to just come up with a really concise explanation. Um, I think basically it's this idea of, again, the humans, the other species and the earth, um, you know, these things that oppress one, they oppress all. And so, you know, I, I keep going back to that example that I gave, because I think it's a really um, clear example, right? You look at a big system like colonialism, right? Um, and colonialism harms everyone in the land that is being colonized. It's harming, obviously, the indigenous people. It's harming the non-human animals. It's harming the land itself. Um, so it's like whatever you're looking at, you know, whatever type of oppression you're looking at, you're looking at how it's harming all the species on earth, it's harming the earth itself, it's harming the humans, it's harming the non-human animals. Um, but it's but it's basically you're kind of looking at the bigger picture and then you're seeing all those pieces within it. So, um, and you know, as I mentioned in the talk that I did on the animal rights show recently, um, obviously not everyone in a total liberationist movement is going to be focusing on the same things. 
it's obviously the goal is to have a mass movement, right? I mean, we hopefully want like most of the inhabitants on Earth to eventually join this uh, movement. So um, it's not, they're not all going to be focusing on the same things. But if you're taking a total liberationist perspective, then you're always going to be looking at how whatever issue you're focusing on affects all of the above. So maybe you're a feminist, right? And maybe, um, you know, some of your entry point uh, is the oppression of women or the oppression of um, the feminine or marginalized genders, right? Um, maybe that's your entry point. But eventually, you know, if you're a total liberationist, you're going to be looking at, well, how does the system of patriarchy not just uh, harm women or marginalized genders, um, but also how does it harm everyone and everything? How does it harm the non-human animals? How does it harm the earth? Um, you know, that's what ecofeminism is really all about, right? Um, kind of taking that broader approach. So whatever your entry point is, you know, for animal rights activists, it might be the oppression of non-human animals and speciesism. For racial justice activists, it might be you know, ending white supremacy and um, racial justice. It could be a lot of different things, you know, ableism, you know, whatever, whatever it is. You're not just mm. going to look at that direct group, but you're going to look at the more expansive you're, 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 you're of how it manifests in all these other ways. Yeah, in my terms, Laura, you're talking about focus and scope, and I don't see any problem with that, so long as whoever wants to, to take any focus doesn't forget about the scope. And so, so long as right. that is the overarching thing that is still there, uh, mm -hmm. you know, hanging about in the background or something even, uh, so long as it's not forgotten about, it seems to me that workable. So wh wh whatever you want to focus your focus on mm -hmm. is is down to, you know, your, 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 you know, your own particular uh, thing and maybe your own particular circumstances and obviously gender, race, those kinds of th things will play right. into that. But so long as the focus is acknowledged and not forgotten about, it seems to me workable. I will say, though, that I would say it's a little deeper than that, because it's not just that those other things are in the background. It's that actually understanding how your focus issue affects those other things and yeah. how the oppression of those other things affects your focus issue is actually going to deepen your understanding of yeah, both. Well, yeah, actually, actually background was to resist. yeah, but background wasn't the, the best word to use. I mean, you 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 might think of it this way instead, might you? The fact that you know you've you might be focusing on one part of an ecosystem, um, you know, and, right. and not you know not not on an, another in 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 that sense. One interesting thing when you were talking about the ecosystem model was mm -hmm. that that immediately made me think that for capitalism, capitalism depends on some sections of it not thriving and in fact you know it's kind of geared on a small group of people thriving on the backs of everybody else not right right and so that so that's the diff the, the the definite dif difference there you know yeah i mean of course that's why capitalism is killing us and killing the other species and killing the planet and um yeah because you're exactly right it uh it predates on the um you know some sectors staying weak yeah it's very carnivorous isn't it mm, yes very <laughs> <laughs> uh from linda what about the connections relationships between spirit soul sentience how might this be conceived yeah i think this is really important because um you know a lot of the foundations of uh speciesism and then the way that speciesism was used um, to subjugate and deny the rights of certain human groups is very much based on this idea of, well, uh, other animals don't have a soul <laughs> or they don't have, um, you know, full sentience. They don't have a spirit. Um, they don't have... Uh, you know, again, um, moral consciousness, um, they don't have, you know, all of these things are uh, used as the foundation for denial of rights. So um, it's very, very significant. I also would say, though, that it goes the other way as well, which is that when we 
expand our circle of compassion, as a phrase is sometimes used, um, that then connects us more with our own souls, right? Um, because that, I mean, what is a soul if it's not, you know, consciousness of our, um, of the suffering of others and of our connection with them and of the need for um, awareness in that way and sensitivity in that way. So I would say it's it's very significant in all of this. Mm. Actually, I've just seen this, which is ironic because I, I did that about five minutes ago, but I, I hadn't seen that. So, so that thanks uh, uh, for that, uh, Linda. This one is interesting. A kind of um, yes, or um, or, or, or maybe uh, maybe some everyone can be a professional footballer for half a week, and then then you'll be really rich. Um, <laughs> regardless of whether you're you're good at kicking a ball or not, but. Uh, <laughs> so uh th that would be an interesting idea wouldn't it you know it's the same as you know there is this idea that um you know people could uh you know people could be given a large sum of money everybody could, should be given a large sum of money and then you're not allowed to as it were spend it but you can use the interest uh, it's interesting <laughs> though because think about the language that's being used here right let allow give <laughs> um i mean give is okay but let and allow like we're so used to thinking of somebody having power over us having the ability to you know give or not give let or not let um that we just automatically think of things these ways whereas if we were really looking at it from a total liberationist perspective we would say well we don't need somebody to let us exist on the land because it's not theirs to control. It's not theirs to own. It's not theirs mm. to decide who gets to live on it and grow their own food or not. We all yeah. can live on this land and grow food because that's what, you know, that's our right as a species living on the planet, human or non-human alike. It's for all of us. Mm. Yeah, I mean, that's that's a very powerful point you just made. And it, it is uh, it is definitely true because, uh, you know, I, I made that I made a, a note when um, you talk about own nature. I remember as a kid. Thinking. Um, how can somebody own a tree? Yeah. You know, a, tr a tree, a tree who has existed before their owner and will exist un unless the owner chops it down. Exactly. Uh, long long after and i i kind of thought that as a real puzzle that mm -hmm. I, I, and i think i mean i think i was quite young and i was just thinking this idea of owning bits of land particularly with it, like a tree or a forest in it didn't make any sense to me to me it's right. a bit weird yeah. yeah it doesn't make any sense when you really think about it it's just that we are not used to even questioning this idea because of course you know, we're indoctrinated from birth into thinking that this is normal. This is the way. Yeah, it as, is. as you as you just said there about that language thing, um, I wanted to. Whoops, I think I've uh, there. Yeah, I wanted to come back to this. Now, uh, you made the point about the um, you know the interlinks between you know human and and other animal exploitation here. Um, mm -hmm. Made me think about there's a, there's a recent uh, video that. Um, Dan, who was in the chat, and Joey Carbstrong put out recently. It was about a local slaughterhouse, and it and it wasn't it wasn't industrialized in the sense that you were talking about, and the people there weren't in that oppressed situation. In fact, the the owner and you could actually see their cars. They seem to have some pretty flash cars. the own The owner was defending the slaughterhouse, and it was her son who was the main guy doing most of the killing. And so it, it didn't fit that model. I just wondered whether, uh, oh, I don't know, is, is it worth acknowledging that that model doesn't fit everywhere or something like that, you know? Mm, yeah, definitely. I think that's a really, really important point. Um, and it's interesting because you then have to question, well, how does it affect them psychologically to do this? Um and not even need to economically. So, you know, I think that a psychoanalytic perspective would be really helpful in that case of, well, 
Um, you know, how is that impacting them psychologically? How are they rationalizing that to themselves? Um, mm -hmm. You know, are they actually getting something that, you know, makes them feel powerful by doing this to non-human animals? Um, you know, maybe they feel disempowered in other ways in their life, for example. Um, or is it that they are compartmentalizing or rationalizing or, you know, trying to block out uh, the realization of what they're doing? Um, you know, I, I would really want to know more about that situation. Um and look at it from that perspective. And also there's a really amazing um, quote from Christopher Sebastian about this idea of, oh, well, if we remove the human oppression element out of slaughterhouse work, you know, wouldn't it be okay then? <laughs> um, he actually received a question at a talk that he gave where uh, somebody mentioned, you know, well, we could just automate it and then we wouldn't have to have that problem anymore. Um, and he said, wow, you know, this is kind of the same logic that's used in uh, drone warfare, right? Oh, well, we don't have any of, you know, our troops having to, um, you know, risk their lives or, uh, you know, get their hands dirty and we can just, you know, be very yeah, distant. Troop, troops on the ground is a real big issue now politically, isn't it? You know, oh, well, there's one thing to give aid and give weaponry and everything but if you put troops on the ground that's a totally different ball game type type idea mm -hmm. you know, so. mm. yeah right okay um i think um oh yeah i was thinking about um one of the things that you said early on was um about the in total liberation it's kind of like i don't know whether you were kind of alluding to the idea of alliance politics but you know the, the kind of um the distinct parts would remain distinct parts. There's a there's a kind of anarchist idea which is um, summed up in the term "we are each other," and uh, it came from it was somebody who um, was a volunteer for the Vegan Information Project, and they they were um, a gender queer uh, vegan feminist um, uh, person, and they were saying that the stronger idea is rather than alliance politics where you maintain the barriers, you kind of morphed into each other. Now, obviously, you couldn't do it on racial grounds, but you could do it in, in other ways. I mean, they 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 would say, for example, <clears throat> I, I don't have to be persuaded to be a vegan because I'm a vegan, and I don't have to be persuaded to be a feminist because I'm, I'm, I'm a feminist already, and so we are each other in those senses already. You, you see, I mean, it's, I thought it was quite an interesting... Kind of idea because it was a challenge to uh alliance politics which kept everything in its compartments um i don't really see alliance politics as keeping everything in its compartments or having boundaries in that way um the way i see it is kind of what we were talking about earlier which is that you have an entry point or a focus um but then you're kind of like expanding that focus out to seeing the bigger picture of all the other um, elements that affect that area of focus. And also, of course, what's going on with uh, the area that you're focusing on, how that's affecting these other elements. So, um, but it's still distinct because you're looking at it, um, you know, very consciously in the way of, I'm gonna look at how it affects this group. I'm gonna look at how it affects that group. Um, you know, so, I mean, there's distinction there, but distinction is different than boundaries or compartments. Mm, yeah, well, I think that's a good answer. And it'd be, interest, it'd be an interesting kind of uh, debate in that sense. I suppose in some senses, th th there's element, elements of both to that. Mm. Right. Uh, well, we don't have any um, further questions or points. Um, everybody is saying thank you. And... Um, I think they're. I think they're hinting at us, Laura, that they want to go home. So uh, <laughs> I'm gonna. I'm gonna thank you once again for this uh, presentation. Um, let's make sure that it's. Thank uh, you. Yeah, spread um, far and wide. And um, thanks for tackling all the uh, the questions as, as well, Laura. And um, hmm, I suppose. Thank you for asking them. <laughs> yeah. So uh, yeah, thanks everybody. Um, thanks for the nine people who have kept with us as well so um thanks very much for that thanks for all your contributions and um for for people for people who are coming across this um as a recording 
sometimes what you'll see is um, a little box at the top right. This is on YouTube. And it, might, it might say turn turn chat on or something like that or ch turn comments on. And what that would do is if you do uh, enable that feature, it means that you'll be able to see the conversation occurring as Laura gave her presentation. And so that would give you a fuller picture. And it'll also explain the, the questions and, and you see where they, where they came from. So that, that might just be a feature that might not be enabled on people's um, YouTubes, uh, you know, that, that kind of thing. So with, with that uh, technical issue, which I don't think I explained very well, uh, I'll say thanks again, Laura. And uh, everyone, goodbye. Thank you, Roger. Thank you, everyone who attended. Yeah. Bye. Cheers. And... Cheers, everyone. Cheers.